Greetings Ranger fans, Jake here for a deeper look at the production of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers once and always. But first, a rapid run through Easter Egg Rundown. <coughs> Let's kick off the counter now, it's Morphin time, okay look how the tech scroll mentions 93. That was the premiere date you see here, Barbara Goodson's voice again, new score composed by Wasserman. Voice clips from back when they were teens for Trini and for Kimberly. 18 buddies think that is a new high score. Rita's magic pulls a move from Legacy Wars. Trini saving Billy's life just like she did back in High Five. Puffy Collars Cleanup Club. Tweet ring headshot child's love. 839 or 938. Rearrange the premiere date. Dark Dimensions hard to scan. Old Monsters part of Rita's plan. Robo Snizzard resurrected a fourth time. Minotaur speaks. Finally he gets a line. Harvey Garvey died in 22. I guess he's done with interviews. Billy's driving Radbug 2. Auto seatbelts nothing new. California license plate. Trini's 70's birthday. See your grave all strewn with flowers. Colored with the Ranger powers. Cranston Tech. Billy's last name said out loud is Architect. Sure would have made Zordon proud. Continuing the Alpha line. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 yells. I, 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 I. And is down with Zack's high fives. Min's a team with attitude. Matching crack on Zordon's too. The Z-Wave gets a name I see. After all this time I'm free. Coral. Harbor, Reset, Astro, Mega Ship, Terra, Venture, Turtle Cove, all on the list. There's Osaka, Kana's in the protocol. Name Bandora, that's Rita Sentai counterpart, and also on the sign on her palace up on the moon. Wrecked by Mondo back in Zio Rocky, wearing red and blue. Hey, it looks like Rocky's meal gets interrupted again. And Cat's JJ's mom just reads so love the dragon. Annie's buzz bless report from Angel Grove Juice Bar, and too much pink energy is dangerous. Morphing sequence recreate. Go Go Power Rangers Hey that ice cream cart appeared in Dino Fury Different heights were stunt pink rangers Vulcan Skull's new billboard Guessed a bulk which stood the test of time Sirius and Trubians Bridge styled like mega ship by Isha Adam back again All three friends from Stone Canyon SPA not SPD more fur from Bandai Legacy Spin kick doesn't break his back Hip hop keto moves by Zack Lightning figures Ravi, Ashley, Merrick and Phantom Ranger Tanya, Devin, Carlos, Nate Kai, Leo, Damon Wow they came from really far. Trent and Connor. All together they are more and Alpha's using Hippling Go gets to drive a crane so low was at the Hyperforce logo volcanoes where the pterodactyl lives. Billy saying affirmative that I'm in Bennett's car you know. Motorcycles overdone praying mantis kung fu style. Rita's dumpster's been brought back. Break the spell by blowing up the monster Rita's headache. Trini clips opening day of the dumpster high five. Teamwork the rock star island of illusion. Part two, welcome to Venus Island. Magic wand makes monster grow with cracking earth and smoke below. Summoning the dinosaur. Scan from the zap megazord. Complete transformation scene. Fully redone in CG. Megazord on the moon. Super Nintendo games. Final fight. Minotaur. Falls to power weapons never beaten by the zords. New cockpit has the same layout. Power crystal joysticks. Second nature feels first time with dinosaurs. Mega power sword falls is drawn and sparkles. Axe rare use of his axe's cannon mode. Aquita recovery. Sestria misses Billy. Zack sharing a scene with the replacement rangers. Min wears every ranger color. Aisha gives her blessing. Passing on the torch. May the power protect you, Min's communicator. Ernie smoothies. A slightly smaller juice bar set missing. A hallway souvenir from Miranoi. And we have story time of Trini back in high five. And the trouble with shell shock. Clip from the song of Guitar Do. Amy Joe's song called Down the Road. A dedication card of Tweet and J. Oh, and they recreated the theme song. And that's the end of the list. At least, I think that's everything. Is that everything? Well, everything I could fit into the song format, at least. If there's something you feel I missed, make sure to comment below. I'm sure there's got to be something that you noticed that I didn't. Now, <clears throat> before my voice gives out, let's take a deeper look. The production of Power Rangers over the course of the last 30 years has perhaps been most heavily defined by its relationship to its source material, regularly utilizing footage from the Super Sentai franchise and building its stories and original designs around that pre-existing material to create something new from something old while still maintaining a sense of visual coherence, with varying degrees of success. There is a plethora of different elements that go into achieving this goal, including, but not limited to, casting, costume design, prop design, set design, light design, visual effects, cinematography, location scouting, the weather. 
shipping costumes and props, recreating costumes and props, recreating sets, recreating effects, and of course editing it all together to optimally obscure the fact that you are watching an amalgamation of two different production teams operating months or sometimes even years apart. But then you have something like Once and Always, where there is no Sentai footage. Well, outside of a few quick flashback clips here and there, all of which I'm pretty sure I just covered in that song. Now, this is not to say that the special is completely unbound from the restrictions of continuity. Much like with past episodes of Power Rangers that have been composed entirely of original footage, largely including things like premieres, crossovers, and finales, and in one case an homage to the classic sci-fi horror film Alien, the production team is still beholden to maintain story continuity with the larger established universe, rather than editing continuity with specific source footage scenes. This means there is a baseline expectation for certain characters, costumes, props, and locations to maintain a clearly recognizable form, if not entirely identical, as the audience requires a degree of clear visual consistency from episode to episode, just as one would expect from scene to scene or shot to shot. However, Once and Always does creatively benefit from one additional factor that many of these previous examples haven't had. Over the course of 30 years, the audience does expect some things to change. Suddenly this opens up a string of questions. What should change? What should remain the same? How would things have changed? Not just in-universe, but how would these same things have been made if they had originally been made today? And what about new elements? How much should they resemble the elements of the past that they might be referencing? How should it all look? How should it all be shot? How should it be directed and edited? And these aren't questions that are unique to Once and Always. In our current media landscape of non-stop revivals, reboots, reimaginings, and adaptations, these are challenges that many production teams must contend with. Power Rangers itself had to deal with a lot of these questions for the 2017 Lionsgate movie, and may very well be in the midst of going through them all again for the long-anticipated Jonathan Entwistle universe. Whenever that may or may not be taking place. However, I think there is a different set of recent tokusatsu works that are even more ripe for comparison. Hideki Anno's Shin Japan Heroes Universe, more specifically Shin Ultraman and Shin Kamen Rider. While this universe may have initiated with the rebuild of Evangelion films and Shin Godzilla, the former is an animated property and the latter is widely known for being one of the more creatively nightmare fuel inducing interpretations of its core character. By contrast, the more recent installments of Shin Ultraman and Shin Kamen Rider are both fascinating examples of engaging in direct visual homage to the initial installments of decades old live action television franchises, much like we're seeing here with Once and Always, although they obviously have the ability to go even further due to being big budget feature length theatrical releases rather than a one hour Netflix special. They might go a little too far sometimes, though. Not going to lie, seeing big screen recreations of the low budget shooting styles of the 50s, 60s, and 70s can be jarring at times, to say the least. In each case, we see modern effects being used to recreate classic effects, but with the small added twists of going beyond the limitations of the original work to better convey the more inhuman elements of their respective universes. Most notably, advances in CG mean that character and costume designs are no longer limited by what kind of suit a human actor can literally fit themselves into. Shin Ultraman accomplishes this rather subtly by slightly shrinking the main character's head to be actually head-sized, rather than the size of a helmet, effectively conveying that, yes, that is his head and that is his face and he is truly alien, while in Once and Always the recreated Megazord is literally scanned from Hasbro's That Megazord toy, meaning that it has the literal proportions that a robot composed of those individual pieces should have. And yes, I know the animation's not perfect, especially with regards to the realism level of the lighting and textures, but let's not pretend that this is on par with the 95 movie or early mainframe entertainment television. It pops, it's accurate, it's doing things the original could never do, and it's one of your favorite childhood toy robots fighting a cybernetic snake monster on the moon, where the lower gravity actually justifies the added acrobatics. The Megazord is also an excellent example of engaging in something that Shin Kamen Rider does a fair bit, by actually recreating exact shots and sequences from the original source material. In Kamen Rider, I'm referring to the shot composition of the opening fight scenes, while Once and Always gives us the full Zord summoning and transformation sequence, something so iconic that it was prominently featured in both the opening and closing credits of every season one episode of Mighty Morphin. 
In both cases, we do see small differences, though. Not every single shot from the original sequence is included or matched perfectly, and there are additional superficial differences as well. Despite the high accuracy of the Zords, the transformation sequence is taking place on the moon rather than in the desert, and Shin Kamen Rider ironically has an inverted change, with the villain and minions sporting new designs while the background is near perfectly recreated, right down to the digital recreation of individual bushes. But the feelings of nostalgia really push through, more so due not only to the choices of which details are included and which details are omitted, but also due to the shape of the framing and presentation. And that's where the editing really comes into play. A major visual element of Shin Kamen Rider is how thoroughly it works to recreate the choppy editing style of the early 70s, often engaging in excessive close-ups and quick cuts that originally would have been used to mask the limitation of those early fight scenes and transformation sequences. Personally, I wasn't the biggest fan of that style, as I found it rather disorienting, but I can acknowledge the strong nostalgic sway that a specifically timed edit can generate, as we not only see it in the Megazord transformation sequence, but also in the recreated opening credits that we see at the end of the special, giving us those same quick cuts to the new transformation sequence as as we experienced with the original back in the early 90s, which I could imagine being just as disorienting to someone not riding that heavy wave of nostalgia. But still, the way that it's timed out to perfectly match the guitar riffs of Ron Wasserman's score is just chef's kiss. However, this does bring me to what I consider to be one of the weakest parts of the special, the shooting and editing of the fight scenes themselves. This was especially frustrating because, much like Shin Kamen Rider, I could tell that a lot of thought and effort went into these fight scenes, but they just did not gel together in a way that I personally found visually appealing. Ironically, whereas Kamen Rider skewed a little too close to that classic shooting style, my issue with Once and Always were in where they diverged. In many regards, the original Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was a fantastic showcase of just how talented these young actors were in performing some truly impressive stunts on a weekly basis, always giving us these simple, bare-bones, wide-sweeping shots that placed their skill and speed front and center, occasionally slowing things down so that we didn't miss a moment of their aerial acrobatics. But Once and Always does not really do that, often bringing the camera right up here when it really feels like we should be taking everything in. The approach they instead seem to be going with is one that is more grounded and immersive, placing the audience right in there with the action through dynamic cuts and camera movements, which is definitely a choice that I can respect even if I don't necessarily agree with it. But the problem is that we often seem to be missing out on that showcase style of martial arts performance, as our heroes' actions are often obscured by the overwhelming villainous forces that they are working to fight through, which is perhaps most notable during the unmorphed putty fight in the recreated Juice Bar Center. But the problem is that we often seem to be missing out on that showcase style of martial arts performance, as our heroes' actions are often obscured by the overwhelming villainous forces that they are working to fight through, which is perhaps most notable during the unmorphed putty fight in the recreated Youth Center. And it doesn't look like they're trying to mask the declining skills of the aging actors, because as far as I can tell, these guys still got it. Steve Cardenas and Walter Jones are both absolutely killing it, despite being in their late 40s and early 50s respectively, and I just... I want to see it! Zack is doing hip-hop keto, but the camera keeps cutting back and forth so that we can't appreciate the fluidity of his moves. We see a putty being thrown by Rocky in slow motion, but we get nothing of the actual throw itself because we're too busy cutting back and forth to Zack being launched into a flying backflip, which also cuts away so fast that you'd be forgiven for thinking that it's just a stuntman, but no, if you pause, you can see that is his face, he is actually the one doing that, why isn't the camera holding on that moment to sell the spectacle to the audience? And that's not even getting into the framing of the shops, where we see Rocky finally pull off that spinning kick that wrecked his back way back at the beginning of Turbo, but the putties are blocking half his upper body and the camera is cutting him off at the legs. You know, the legs. Where the kicking happens? And honestly, I could keep going on because this extends to Min's half of the fight, too. The choreography is rock solid, the performers are nailing the moves and really selling it, but the camera angles, the framing, the timing of the cuts are simply doing them no favors, relying upon techniques that traditionally would have been used to hide the presence of stunt doubles or obscure an actor's lack of physical skill, 
which really does not seem to apply to this situation. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the actors were making mistakes and getting tired, limiting the number of usable takes, and necessitating these exercises of obfuscation. In which case, the director and editor were probably making the right call. But there are just so many moments where the camera positioning feels too low, or too high, or too close, and we're seeing the backs of heads, the backs of legs, and there just feels like there is a general misalignment between the actions being performed and the visual framing of its presentation. And in truth, I feel like this applies to many of the ranger fights too, which one would think would have even less of an excuse, but it's definitely most prominent here. Which is a shame because the juice bar set is awesome. Much like with the Megazord sequence, it's an excellent example of taking the general shape of things and including just enough very specific details that the audience's minds are able to fill in the gaps and obscure the slight differences in how it's been redesigned or rescaled to fit the purposes of the new production. The set design for the entire special is honestly incredibly on point, with different locations having different levels of fidelity to the original sets that inspired them, with the juice bar obviously being the most accurate, followed by Rita's palace which appears to have merged the aesthetics of her original balcony with Zed's, while also acknowledging the level of damage and disrepair that it would have experienced from both the Machine Empire invasion and from decades of disuse. Although upon reflection, it is kind of surprising that she was better able to restore it in Day of the Dumpster after a 10,000 year absence than she was after a 27 year one. I mean, she spent a whole year fixing up this place and couldn't be bothered to pick up a new lamp or curtains? Anyway, we also have Billy's new command center under Cranston Technologies, which may not be a literal recreation like the other two examples, but is very much designed to evoke the original command center and power chamber, preserving much of the same layout and comparable external architecture, while still having technologically updated set dressing and details like touch screens instead of switches, and images of colored comets instead of a broad star field. And then to circle back around, we have the cockpit of the Megazord itself, which preserves very little of the original design beyond the general layout, yet lacks the same degree of justification for those changes that the other sets might have, beyond the general implication that it was reconstructed along with the rest of the dinosaurs after the destruction of the Thunder Megazord back in Ninja Quest. Although, now that I think about it, they did actually still have that original cockpit in use during Grid Connection, so I guess this was actually just a recent renovation? Or the production team just felt like going a different way on this one, which really just comes down to personal preference. And in many regards, the same thing applies to the costume and prop designs, as fidelity varies according to whatever details the production team finds most important, and whether or not we're watching one of the original characters returning, or a new character inspired by someone from the past. The ranger suits, for example, are pretty well spot on, with just a few minor textural differences on the gloves and boots, slightly different padding on the necks, and occasionally different shades of color on the helmets, with their morphers and weapons largely being sourced from Bandai's Legacy Collection, a toy line that was highly accurate, but didn't exist during the original run of the series and was not necessarily always made from the same materials. But honestly, they largely look better than the originals. Higher levels of detail absolutely show up on the higher definition footage, and it is absolutely appropriate to use higher quality materials to reflect that. The higher quality of costume also extends to Alpha 8 and Alpha 9, although it's hard to necessarily say the same for our other robotic legacy characters. Not to imply that the monster designs are lacking by any means, only that it is extremely difficult to supersede the already highly detailed work regularly produced for Sentai, and especially the mythological themes present in the Zoo Ranger monsters. Robo Minotaur and Robo Snizzard both successfully deliver clean evolutions of their past designs that are easily on par with previous reimaginings like Zeltrax's costume into Snides, and I would argue actually better than Goldar's evolution into Goldar Maximus due to strong sense of intentionality present in the work. Unfortunately, I can't really say the same for Robo Rita. It's just the classic Rita costume with bulky gloves and a pretty flat mask. It's just not doing it for me. Not to say that I don't enjoy Robo Rita as a character, as Barbara Goodson's return to the role is absolute gold and 100% sells every single line, allowing me to set aside any qualms I have with the design, just like Richard Horvitz's return allows me to ignore the fact that our newest alpha models are a full head taller than the ones we grew to know and love in the early days. But this only serves to highlight how the impacts of these designs and sequences are intrinsically linked to our emotional connections to the characters themselves and the moments that we recall from our childhood. And I'm fairly certain from the final product that the production team was keeping all of that in mind throughout the entire production process. 
There are honestly just so many elements of clear, intentional, thematic emotionality that I'm going to need a whole other video just to get through it all. Yes, that's right, I still have one more of these. Keep your eyes open, I'll be getting it out faster than this one, I promise. While there is definitely a tremendous level of attention to detailed recreations and referential flourishes, the core of what makes Once and Always work so well, along with the Shin Japan Heroes universe and so many other successful revivals, reboots, reimaginings, and adaptations, is that they recognize the most important thing is not always to perfectly reproduce that past work, but instead to recapture the feelings that made the audience want to revisit it all over again. And really, nitpicking things like whether or not the aspect ratio of the morphing sequence perfectly translates to the new proportions of the modern widescreen ultimately ends up feeling like critiquing the penmanship of a stirringly crafted love letter. Also, Radbug 2 is awesome, we love Radbug 2, we need more Radbug 2. Put Radbug 2 into Cosmic Fury, please, and thank you.